Welcome back to Revolution in Ideology. I'm Jared. I'm Nick. And today we are going to dig into zombie metaphors and tropes. This is kind of like tangential to the research we've been doing on our fascination with the apocalypse, our historical, sociological, philosophical, contextual fascination. Obviously, uh, zombies are part of the apocalyptic literature. They're not always part of like, they don't always bring the apocalypse, but they are definitely a major, major player here. So we decided to go on this tangent. Um, it might even be the most popular of the tangents. The reason we've created this list essentially is to give us a little bit of a, like a table of contents almost for further research into this topic. So even if we don't touch upon everything that you think we need to talk to regarding the communism metaphor, the capitalism metaphor, things along those lines. This is just a list to get us started. And then we will probably do some research and record episodes on most of these, if not all of them. Before we go further, uh, I, I know Nick wants to talk a little bit about the distinction here between myth and metaphor in regards to the zombie tropes. I mean, I think it's important to understand the root of the zombie myth and like where that originates from, which we'll talk about in a second. And how that's different than what we've come to know in like American cinema, as an example, not that it's unique to America, but, you know, American cinema and literature, like those are the metaphors basically we'll be talking about. It's like, you know, what does the zombie mean in these films and so forth? But we have to understand that it originates in Haitian folklore, right? The myth of the zombie comes from that history. So there's a myth like the zombie myth and the zombie metaphor, right? Those are two completely different things that I think is worth talking about. Sure. So let's dig right in. Um, so before we get into the metaphors, the more modern metaphors, as we've kind of um, um, co-opted this idea from its Haitian origins, um, let's let's talk about them. The myth first appeared in Haiti in the 17th and 18th centuries when the country was known as Saint-Domingue and ruled by France, which hauled in African slaves to work on sugar plantations. Slavery in Saint-Domingue under the French was extremely brutal. Half of the slaves brought in from Africa were worked to death within a few years, which led only to the capture and import of more. The zombie archetype as it appeared in Haiti and mirrored the inhumanity that existed there from 1625 to around 1800 was a projection of the African slaves' relentless misery and subjugation. Okay, so that first little part there comes to us from the Atlantic. It's a direct quote. Those are their words, not mine. Um, specifically, the author's name is Mike Mariani. But before we dig into the second part of that quote, I think it's interesting to note that its connection is to slavery. Any reason you think that might be the case? Um, why would this, in fact, we already know why it might be the case. Why might this myth come during an era of slavery? What might be the connection, Nick? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of really, really good work here by a scholar named Sarah Juliet Loro, and her the name of her book is escaping me, but I have it right here. Um, it's called The Transatlantic Zombie, Slavery, Rebellion, and Living Death. And she does a lot of work tracing this myth, right, this folklore, this legend to Africa, specifically the Congo uh, area of the Congo and tracing it from there to Haiti. And, you know, these original stories of people that would steal your soul and like, and so forth and how that then evolved as it transitioned to Haiti and came, you know, sort of more of the myth, myth that we're, we're familiar with, but like directly related to slavery, which is your question is this idea of, you know, like the soulless worker, uh, working in the fields, specifically the sugar, uh, cane fields and factories in Haiti at the time is the origin here. Mariani and his description goes on to say something somewhat controversial. We have not been able to substantiate it with any primary source research, but I do think it's an interesting conversation that is brought up in this article. Uh, the article is called The Tragic Forgotten History of Zombies. He says Haitian slaves believed that dying would release them back um, to basically Guinea or Africa in general, a kind of afterlife where they could be free. Though suicide was common among slaves, those who took their own lives wouldn't be allowed to return to Guinea. Instead, they'd be condemned to skulk the Hispaniola plantations for eternity, undead slaves at once denied their own bodies and yet trapped inside them. Soul is zombies. Again, we haven't been able to substantiate that with any primary source work. Um, and uh, the research you've just, you Loro's research you just referenced also doesn't seem to indicate this. Why do you think there might be this divergence on this? I mean, honestly, it's a very important idea if you think about the trope, like suicides. Th this is not a, this is not a joke of a subject here regarding mm -hmm. um, slaves, uh, basically ability to cope with their their untenable situation. 
Yeah, I mean, right, this narrative is that the slave masters used, you know, the threat of zombification basically on their slaves to convince them to work and to not commit suicide, right? So if the Haitians believed, sorry, if the Haitian slaves believed that when they died, they were essentially freed, the slave owners had to have some kind of yep. tool in their arsenal to, you know, indoctrinate them into believing that suicide was wrong, right? So that they wouldn't just kill themselves to be free. And so the story goes that they use this threat of zombification in that manner, that if you killed yourself, you weren't freed, you were then, you know, sentenced essentially to eternity as a worker in the fields. Like Jared says, we haven't actually been able to find evidence of that. And um, LaRoe in her book takes issue with this version. And she says, you know, for two reasons, basically. First off, she hasn't been able to find any corroboration of this existing in any records whatsoever. And second, that the evolution of the zombie narrative, which we'll talk about in a second, would require zombification as a tool to be taken from the oppressors and put into the power of the oppressed, which uh, there's no evidence of that happening either. Perfect. So importantly, the myth evolves. And the myth evolves after the Haitian Revolution when slavery is no longer as big a factor, although it must be stressed um, that slavery was still important in other parts of the Caribbean where the myth was also making its rounds. Um, and Haiti itself even dabbled in the idea of, of, of reintroducing slavery a time or two for the next, I don't know, five or six decades. But regardless, to make it clean, let's say the Haitian Revolution is an important point in um, in evolving this myth. Mariani goes on to say that after the Haitian Revolution in 1804 and at the end of French colonialism, the zombie became a part of Haiti's folklore. The myth evolved slightly and was folded into the voodoo religion with Haitians believing that zombies were corpses reanimated by shamans and voodoo priests. Sorcerers, known as Bokor, used their bewitched undead as a free labor or to carry out nefarious tasks. Kind of doubling down on this idea is a different source. We like to kind of diversify them. This is from a psychologist named Dr. Evan Axelrod in an article he wrote called The Psychology of Zombies, Why Are Zombies So Infectious? He goes on to say, zombies were believed to be people who had been brought back from the dead through voodoo by Bokor, uh, who were basically voodoo sorcerers. They had extensive knowledge of poisons such as tetra, uh, tetradoxin, which is found in the pufferfish. Bokors would administer the poison to an individual, rendering them in a state that resembled death. These drugged individuals would be buried only, be, only to be exhumed later and placed into slave labor, kept docile by being administered uh, psychoactive drugs like Datura, also known as the zombie cucumber. This classic zombie was very much a living human who, through drugs, religious ceremonies, and behavioral manipulation, were convinced that they were dead and that their soul had been taken from them. These zombies did not have a desire to eat anyone's brains. Any thoughts on that? That I, I, The first part's fine. It, ta it talks about, like, Mariani's talking about the transition from the Haitian Revolution, where the myth becomes, I mean, mm -hmm. part of the folklore. Fine. But this idea that Axelrod introduces, there, were, there was an actual, like, material thing that took place. Like, these Bokor were using actual poisons or toxins to change people's behavior. Any commentary there? I mean, the, the, those two are the same, basically, right? Um, Axelrod just provides more detail. Sure. But I must stress, like, this is all still myth and folklore, right? There's not, right. like, a proven instance of this ever happening. Um, okay, so doubling down on this via film as we kind of move forward, right? We, we will go into, basically, we go through the Haitian Revolution. We go through, uh, of course, a little bit of the, mm, let's say, like, kind of the neo-colonial era where the U.S. is influencing the development of Haiti until after the Civil War, the U.S. finally decides it's going to recognize Haiti as an independent nation state. But then, of course, constant interventions lead to a full-blown uh, basically invasion and occupation in 1915 that goes often overlooked because there's obviously a lot of things going on in the world in 1915, uh, Mexican Revolution, World War One, et cetera. But, but people forget the United States actually occupied Haiti during this period of time. I only mention this because this is when this, the myth itself is going to make its way right through these Americans that are occupying Haiti back to the United States. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of them were like Catholic missionaries and things along those lines. And soldiers. If we fast, oh, what, go ahead. And soldiers. And soldiers. If we fast forward... Um, another decade or two after this initial occupation of Haiti in 1915, 
Some of these narratives uh, find their way uh, basically to quote unquote Hollywood. The first zombie movie or credited zombie movie, full, let's say full length zombie movie is uh, famous. It's called The White Zombie in 1932 and it was directed by Victor Halperin. It's basically the story of a white couple that go to visit Haiti. Um, a plantation owner, a white plantation owner ends up falling in love with the the wife or the prospective wife and he gets a voodoo shaman basically to zombify her so that he could potentially steal this prospective wife for himself. Um, any commentary you want to add to that? No, I mean, that's that's the basic plot, right? This is the first, this film is it's a really interesting, like, not that it's a great film from like the film perspective, but it's really interesting in the history of the zombie myth and the zombie narrative, because it's literally the plot of the film is like white people going to Haiti, but the film represents right. White people taking this myth and taking it to Hollywood and then transforming it into like now this American product that we now are all familiar with, right? This film is the first example of the Americanization of the zombie myth in popular media. And it actually stays fairly true to the voodoo original kind of folklore uh, of the time as far as like how the process goes and like he poisons her and she, you know, is in the state of su suspended animation. Then after the funeral, they go and get her body and she becomes a zombie and like so forth. Um, so it, it's pretty close to at least, you know, what the myth was, how this process would go down. But the film is interesting. You know, it's the first time an American uh, Hollywood film uses the zombie, zombie anything. It is a product of its time being an early 20th century film. Um, so by modern terms, we would consider a lot of it wildly racist and xenophobic. I don't know. Um, and I think Nick agrees that it was intentionally this way. Like that was the point of the film is to be racist and xenophobic regarding um, Haiti. Um, but it comes off that way just because of the time in which it was produced. So that yeah, it's not like, you know, birth of a nation as an example was intentionally racist. Like that's the whole point right. of the film, but this one is just like, like you said, a product of his time. Yeah. Okay. So that's it. We've set the context here. Let's dig into these metaphors. We're going to go through them um, relatively quickly. Cause like I said, each one of these, maybe not each one, um, as I'm looking at the first one, I don't know that we're going to, we're going to go much further into um, much further into this first one, but regardless, we're going to, our goal is to research each one of these or as many of them as we can and dig a little bit deeper in their own standalone episodes, except again, maybe this first one. So without further ado, let me just spit it out. The first um, metaphor of the zombie outbreak or and or apocalypse could be um, a metaphor for the Cold War itself. So uh, the first thing I thought when I when I was researching this is this is just going to be another generic um, Western communist trope, right? Especially for like USers or, or NATO aligned countries that they're going to say that the zombies are essentially just all like minded, hive thinking individuals. I think I put in here Borg like, right? Like from like Star Trek, but it, it actually really isn't that. They're, the Cold War and communism does figure into the metaphor but in a way that's kind of interesting. There's not much here, ideologically speaking, once one might survive that the group think hive mind board like trope would have become more popular here to critique communism. But most content of this era that was zombie related was more critical of like the material conditions at the time. Nuclear arms races and space races were among the, tar were the more the target of the metaphor with those narratives weaving their way in and out of discussions on reanimated corpses after a fallout to leaks of experimental elements causing vast pandemics. In fact, if any ideology finds itself in question, it's fascism, as Nazi experimentation becomes a primary target. And so Nazi zombies persist throughout this era, too, um, from a very famous film called The Creature with the Atomic Brain in 1950 top, 1955, all the way to like the modern era, um, a film I... I forgot I had seen, but I had seen it called Dead Snow in 2009 to another film called Outpost in 2012. Nazi zombies seem to be a big thing. And of course, um, we gamified it in, in the Call of Duty series, became a very popular form um, of entertainment, was shooting not just zombies and not just Nazis, Nazi zombies, the ultimate enemy, right? So <laughs> on that. No, I don't think so. Like you said, like you would have thought that this would have been an anti- communist thing right like in the 60s but it didn't really play out like that which is kind of interesting because in some of the other like things we talked about with the apocalypse 
apocalypse in cinema, it does play out like that. You know, it's Cold right. War stuff, obviously, nuclear fallout, et cetera. But the zombie trope doesn't really play in there very much, which is kind of surprising, actually. Okay. So the second metaphor that we want to talk about is othering. Um, we can debate whether or not white zombie um, portrays Haiti as a foreign, scary other because of this whole voodoo discussion and the zombification that takes place there. There's going to be debate there or whether it was just a product of the 1930s. Regardless, othering does become a important trope within, um, again, both zombie outbreak and zombie apocalyptic media. The newer version of the trope casts a wider net pending that contextual fears, both like creators and consumers might have, regarding what's taking place at the time, right? Maybe it's an immigration issue, maybe it's a war issue, whatever it is, this is going to influence why people are consuming, um, and not even just consuming, I should say, creating and consuming so much zombie media. Zombies symbolize what one should fear, the incoming or rising quote unquote other. Whoever that might be at a given time, zombies are like culture gone awry. They are communal creatures in that they vaguely share proximity, but there is no good among them. They cannot read in or reach out to one another. They do not coordinate to achieve concurrence. They lack culture. Not belonging anywhere, being from anywhere, this is precisely part of an encroaching foreignness. Zombies lack home. The vacancy in a zombie's gaze provides a window to the absence of soul. Their ugliness is catchable, and they have a 100% rate of contagion. If you come into the contact with a zombie, infection follows inevitably. We don't want to be ugly, mindless, homeless, or incommunicable. So when confronted with a zombie, we take care to keep our distance. Now that quote right there that I just read comes to us from John Verveke. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly in his book called Zombies in Western Culture. He actually co-authored it with a couple of other uh, individuals, and, and, and it's been a great resource for us. But coming back to what he's insinuating here. He goes through all of the things um, that scare us about zombies. And it's not just the fact that they're going to eat our brains, although that does come in, come into the foray later. What do you think of what he's saying regarding like the zombie representing essentially in so many different ways, the other, like the homelessness, the incommunicable, they're not communicable. Uh, they're mindless. They're ugly. They're all of these things that we should fear about something foreign or something that has been subordinated. What do you think of that? Yeah. I read another, in another article where they were talking about how the fact that zombies can't speak right and they basically don't have identities they're essentially you know no one leaves them open for us to be able to imprint upon them any of our fears right mm -hmm. so that they can really stand for and symbolize anything right so like you said it could apply to you know a war or an immigration issue that's currently going on like we can use them to be quote unquote the other regardless of what that other is because they don't speak for themselves they oftentimes don't have agency for themselves, right? They can they can be anything that we want them to be. Absolutely. And again, like I said, I mean, Hollywood, I mean, I shouldn't even just say Hollywood, basically any type of media from time immemorial, from our first storytellers way back when we were hunter-gatherers, a lot of them just tell us stories, socialize us into these ethically constitutive ways of thinking, speaking, and acting, um, not just uh, in a way to condition us, but to reflect the material conditions of the time period. And that's the type of storytelling we're talking about here. It's not as prescriptive as much as it might be reactive. What do you think of that? No, yeah, totally agree. Okay, so the next metaphor or trope we want to talk about is uh, othering again, but from a different point of view, perhaps a completely different ideological point of view, maybe a more inclusive understanding of zombies, or maybe a more, I don't know if the word inclusive fits here, but maybe a more humanizing aspect of zombies. I'll let you commentate on this in just a second. But, mm -hmm. but in terms of overcoming othering, I, I'll add... The overwhelming majority of films cast zombie as the other, as we just mentioned. There are a few outliers in which we actually get to experience the zombie as our hero. They're almost all comedy related, and, and we just put out an episode on, on zombies focusing mostly on um, zombie land. These are a couple other shout outs that need to be mentioned, though, where um, that's a comedy that's still from the um, perspective of the hero. These are comedies in which the zombie itself is the hero. A uh, very famous film in 2013 called Warm Bodies portrays the zombie as the hero. And again, it is a comedy. 
Uh, zombie is kind of a comedy slash drama around a zombie turned doctor and using that skill to be better at healthcare, but also kind of comedic. That came out in 2015. And uh, probably most famously, although recently canceled, I hear, uh, The Santa Clarita Diet in 2017 with Drew Barrymore, where she is um, a regular old just... Um, suburban housewife for lack of a better term that eventually becomes a zombie but also somewhat of a hero she ends up basically choosing to eat bad humans right so like one of her first like victims is like this like neo-nazi guy and and you end up rooting for her this way and seeing things through her eyes these humanize the zombies enough usually as the main characters um there's others that kind of touch upon this where the zombies become more humanized but the story is not told through their lens but it does reveal that they have culture intelligence sometimes they even develop language um that is not the same as human but different but still is willing to entertain the idea that these groups um, are going to evolve into something more than they already are. And of course, those two are very famous. Um, probably the most famous of them is called I Am Legend, uh, obviously a book and then a very famous Will Smith movie. And more recently, um, the Army of the Dead films that are making their way around Netflix show a learning, intelligent zombie that might be Maybe I won't even say the zombie's evolving. We might make the argument in some of these that the zombie is the next evolution of of humanity. Any thoughts before I carry on with this? No, uh, I mean that's definitely not in the Will Smith version, but in the original book, that's yeah. definitely the I Am Legend narrative. Is that I mean that's why it's called I Am Legend, right? He is the last human being. In the end, he realizes that he is their legend because they are going to populate the earth, right? Yeah, there's always a lesson in in well in both I Am Legend and, and the Army of the Dead ones that there's some sort of um, rationale to these creatures' behaviors, mm -hmm. um, and maybe even point to the idea that the humans that are they're in conflict with might be the irrational ones. But it demonstrates zombie agency that the traditional trope doesn't right the mm -hmm. traditional trope as we just discussed in the first version of othering is again it's not communicable they don't have identity they don't really have names they're homeless they're just mindless consumers which of course consumption will get to later on down the line um Another these are a little bit example different. here this made me think of that i forgot to put in the notes is disney has a film that now has a sequel and i think there's even a third one coming out called zombies and i only know this because my seven-year-old daughter watches it all of the time and i've watched it with her the first one no, and the second one but it's set in a high school and zombies and in the first one, zombies and humans start going to the same high school. And the zombies are like regular zombies that you would see in a traditional film. You know, they're like violent and blah, blah, blah. But they have this technology called Z-bands that they wear and that keeps their like zombie symptoms in check. And so they're like then quote unquote normal. And so they start going to school together. And this is a perfect example because it's like the integration of the zombies with the humans but then there are times when the zombie power is like you know valued like as an example the main character i don't remember his name but he takes off his z-band and plays for the football team and like destroys everyone like as an example right yeah no that is a good one um okay i still don't know that providing some sort of agency to the zombies completes the more i don't know inclusivity progressive mm -hmm. um uh, metaphor that we're we're seeking to kind of outline here. The trope finds itself within the group of survivors, oftentimes in the post-zombie and now more rather than just zombie outbreak, apocalyptic era. So basically from the civil rights era forward, inclusivity, representation, and minority leadership have slowly but surely been better and better revealed in zombie media. And that could be part of the trope as well, that in this new world, right, if we go back to our apocalyptic understanding of things, this is an opportunity to wipe the slate clean and start something new. And the zombies aren't even the major feature there. They're just the vehicle to get us there. Fine. Mm -hmm. um, the new community that forms, though, becomes, as I just mentioned, more inclusive. There's better representation. Um, there's better leadership among um, African-American community, Latinx community, LGBTQ plus community, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, women. Like you're going to see much more diversity there as we, which is kind of mirroring the more, um, the civil rights movement forward. Any thoughts on that? No, that's the only reason I use zombies, even though it's cheesy. It is the only one I can think of that is actually what we're going for here with the overcoming othering, where like the zombies are the outcasts, right? They are the minority. They are the ones that are shunned, et cetera. And mm -hmm. I mean, everyone's like literally protesting the integration of the high school and like blah. And the whole plight of the film is 
everyone getting over and becoming accepting of like the zombies, right? So it's really like it to me represents that, but it's not like a mainstream film. It's just on Disney Plus or whatever. I mean, I no, guess that it's is popular that's among example. kids, but. Well, and, and then and then if I come back to the communities, in theory, again, it kind of pa- paints this rosy picture that we're getting back to the idea of a true meritocracy, that it doesn't matter uh, your race, your gender, your sexual mm. orientation or anything along those lines. I mean, it's definitely it, a very it, liberal narrative, right? Right. Yeah. Like whoever is the best at whatever it is, being the leader will be the leader regardless of any of those things. Right. Mm. And you've, you've wiped the slate clean. There's no nepotism, right? There's no carrying on, um, economic legacies from the past. Yeah. So all of that is wiped clean. So that's part of it. Okay. Fourth metaphor, drug abuse. This one I hadn't really considered. Um, I don't have a whole lot to say, but I think it's interesting that it was brought up by, um, the RZA of the Wu-Tang clan in his book, uh, the Tao of Wu, which was written in 2009. I hadn't considered it, but he mentions it, so I feel like it deserves a shout out here. Drug abuse. He basically says, and I quote, the night of the living dead predicted the dawn of crack. If you lived in the hood in the 80s, you saw that movie coming to life on the street. There's a reason Public Enemy titled that song Night of the Living Bass Heads. That's essentially his quote, but I think there's a little bit more here. Like I said, I don't have a lot, but I think there's a little bit more here. Do you think it is a caution? Like if we argue that zombies are a metaphor for drug abuse or the maybe even part of the war on drugs or something along those lines. Do you think it's a cautionary tale or a critique? Well, I mean, here's, I think this is a good point to mention. You know, we, there's two different things we have to consider and we do this every time we talk about a film, right? What is the intent of the filmmaker? Right. And what is us putting our lenses on the characters? Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Riza uses Night of Living Dead as an example. We have to ask ourselves, you know, was the director of that film creating the zombies in such a way intentionally to represent drug addicts, right? Or is it the Riza and, you know, in the 1980s, people consuming that and, you know, that's the context in which they are existing. And so they're putting that themselves on the zombies of that film. You know what I mean? I would argue it's probably the latter. I would also agree with you on that, but I think that's also the beauty of beauty of all art forms across time and space is, right. and it's a conversation that we can't solve. Is it's the artist's intent or the audience's reception that matters more? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, yeah, no, I think that's perfect. All right. Next metaphor, pandemics. This one's obvious. Many of these zombie outbreaks start and are our pandemics. If we, if, if the narrative goes far enough along, they end up being apocalypses. They don't always, but oftentimes they do, but they always start as pandemics. So they are definitely a metaphor for the idea of pandemics. Obviously that means a little something more in 2022 after the last two years we've just had. Um, definitely something that, that, that people are considering um, every time they probably consume this media. I don't know that there needs to be much more explanation on the pandemic, but I do want to say a surprisingly large amount of the media contains origin stories based around scientific experimentation gone awry, which again ties back to even those Cold War origins, or not even, I shouldn't say origins, those Cold War tropes that we talked about Mm -hmm. already. There's also alien inoculation, which might have a, I don't know, it might be a little bit of a corollary there with othering, but I don't necessarily want to dig into that right this second. The exemplary shout out to the um, pandemic trope within the zombie metaphor goes to the Resident Evil video game franchise. Um, They also um, allow us to critique the idea of the evil corporation, which we'll get to later when we talk about capitalism and consumption, by making the Umbrella Corporation like the evil. Like the zombies are bad and you're fighting the zombies or shooting the zombies or whatever. I haven't played every version of that game for sure. There's like 25 of them. I don't even know. But regardless, I do know that even though the zombies are the immediate bad, ultimately the meta bad is this umbrella corporation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, to the best of my recollection, correct me if I'm wrong. Again, it's been a while since I played a Resident Evil. I only Evil ever game, but... played the first one, so I have no idea what it's morphed into, but that's definitely the first one. Right. We also have to give a shout out to um, Train to Busan, which of course is the South Korean film that is also set during a zombie outbreak, which may or may not become an apocalypse. I forget if there's a sequel coming or not. I do honestly forget that, but maybe somebody in the comments can can let me know. But also in that one, the corporation, um, and in this case, not necessarily the corporate be the corporation being malevolent, um, but maybe the corporation being. Um, uncaring, right? Just completely indifferent to what's taking place um, because it's still profitable. Anyway, um, Nick, you also mentioned when I was looking at the notes that you added here, 28 Days Later was seminal. Um, Remind me, I've seen 28 Days Later, but for some reason I am 
I mean, you're talking about the pandemic part, not the corporate part, right? Correct. Yeah. Pandemic part. Yeah. I mean, most people point to Resident Evil as the game and 28 Days <laughs> Later being really the first like film that takes this to the next level and is like the seminal turning point in this metaphor, you know? Okay. Yeah. Apparently I overlooked it. I've seen it and I've consumed way too much zombie content in my life, but somehow that didn't, that didn't register for me, but yeah, yeah it absolutely fits. In fact, it probably is even better example than Train to Busan, but okay. The next metaphor, the absurd. It is a metaphor for the observe or the intensifying meaningless. This meaninglessness. This comes to us again from uh, one of our sources, Zombies in Western Culture by John Vervaki, who again was written to in 2017. Uh, he goes on to say, the traditional apocalypse is the religious macrocosm of this perspectival shifting, but the zombie apocalypse bankrupts it. The world of the zombie decays, but there is no revelation to redeem the fall. When the frame around reality is shattered, it is left asunder and never reformed. The realness marked by insight is foreclosed by the utter limpness of the zombie world, where there is no longer sustained vitality or the ethos of industry. There's some property to this world that lacks the dynamism for creation and reinvention. Nature overgrows, but nothing cultural grows from it. There is no cosmic insight that pulls back the veil of the working of reality. What do you think of that? I actually thought that quote was fire. Yeah. Um, and it does tie into content we were digging into, I don't know, three or four months ago mm -hmm. around the absurd a little bit. Yeah. So any thoughts? No, we did the whole series on Camus and the myth of Sisyphus yep. and the, the rebel, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I love this idea that like whenever the world gets destroyed or something catastrophic happens, we have this in literature, maybe in real life too, I guess. We have this expectation that like, you know, we're going to see behind the curtain and see the real like, you know, operations of the world and see some sort of truth. Right. And I love this explanation here that the zombie trope reveals to us that there is no that doesn't exist. Right. That during the zombie apocalypse, the zombies are like we've talked about, right, these mindless, soulless, non-speaking, non-cultural, like, et cetera non-communicating entity, right? They're not people, they're just things, they're objects. And so during the zombie apocalypse, right, the world ends and then that's it. There's nothing more. The zombies rule the earth. And like he says here, something nature overgrows, but nothing cultural grows from it, right? That it's over. There's no, there's nothing that's revealed. There's no great truth that we've all been waiting for. Like it's just, it's over, right? It's meaningless and absurd and mm -hmm. that's it. Yep. Fire. Okay. The last one we're going to talk about today, uh, we saved the biggest and most obvious, but still maybe best for last. Um, the zombies are a metaphor for mindless consumption associated with capitalism and critiques on labor. So all of those we've kind of woven together into this large critique of capitalism. Um, I can't, I mean, we could probably um, flesh this out into like three or four different subcategories. I don't feel like it. Mm -hmm. it they're all they're all critiques of the capitalist hegemony um, of basically basically starting with 1968 when when we see this change with the Romero film um, all the way through the modern commentary we see today with things like Army of the Dead and they're trying to get the millions of dollars out from Las Vegas and things along those lines like that always seems to make its way into um, the zombie metaphor as well as the various tropes whether again they're outbreak based or apocalyptic. So I'm just actually going to go through some of the quotes that we found over the last few days that were kind of original. I thought they were original takes on this critique of capitalism, um, mindless consumption and labor. So uh, the appetite for a zombie is a very particular kind of appetite. No matter how much a zombie devours, it will continue feeding for as long as it is able. Its gormandizing is indiscriminate and voracious and its famishment apparently bottomless, but it is insubstantial. The zombie represents raw consumption. It does not seem to imbibe the things it consumes. It simply extinguishes, extinguishes them. A zombie never stops eating, but never grows or changes. In its inst insatiability, the zombie has put its face to the disorder of addiction. It craves with absolute singularity, and its craving becomes its nature. It wants to have, but never to be. It is constantly filling, but never gets full. Again, this comes to us from John Bravacki in Zombies in Western Culture, 2017. This first quote, what do you think? I mean, I don't have anything to add. I think this is the basic summation of this metaphor, you know. Yeah, the zombie is never happy. It's never satisfied. It is constantly consuming, mindlessly so, of course. Um, and and that's like that's its reason for existence, which, uh, again, from a critical lens would be the point of existence here in Western culture, right? We only, 
I mean, we, we basically have been socialized into, we only exist if we are constantly consuming, right? Like Mm -hmm. that's how we measure our success. Um, or, even the point of our living. Okay. Well, and like, we're completely soulless in that action, right? Like yeah. the zombies have, they have no lives. They have no, you know, they don't no. sit down and have conversations with each other. You know, it's the brains. That's like literally the, the trope, right? The argument here is that we're, we're the same. We think that we're not, but we don't exist unless we are consuming. Right. We are the zombies, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's essentially what this trope is. Like the most common part of this trope that critiques mindless consumption and capitalism is the fact that the zombies aren't real. We are the zombies. Like, mm-hmm. does that make sense? Like, that's 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 essentially what I think a lot of these films are trying to portray. Um, okay, Tyler Malone in his article, "The Zombies of Karl Marx: Horror in Capitalism's Wake," written in 2018, argues that Dawn of the Dead reimagines hell as a shopping mall. The film's famous tagline, "When there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk the earth," could have just as easily been. When there's no more room in hell, the dead will be damned to shop. Insatiable consumption. Capital's modus operandi becomes the true horror of the film. We may enjoy buying things, may even love our collected knickknacks, but we remember not only the mall, but the thing we've always secretly known, that the always already terror lurks in the shadows of capitalism, consumerism, and commercialism. True hell isn't a dance with the devil, but continuous mindless consumption long after the joy of the indulgence has left us. So this continues with Vervaki's thought, but then argues that it's the actual action itself that makes it, it takes it the next level. This is hell. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to add to that? Nope. Riza adds the same thing here, basically talking about Dawn of the Dead again. He says, the zombies were Americans just walking through the mall, lost, trying to find excitement outside themselves. They forgot that excitement isn't buying a new TV. He uses the word excitement there. I think he might mean like excitement beyond just like, oh, like this is something cool. Like I'm on a ride, an amusement park ride. That excitement is meaning meaning in life, I think Mm -hmm. is what he's assuming. Um, Or maybe I'm making that assumption reading into his words. Um, Bishop goes on though, to kind of complete the thought process here. So we have mindless consumption represented by the zombies. That's our reason for existence. And it is soulless. It is mindless. It's whatever. We then have Bishop arguing, or in this case, excuse me, Malone arguing, I should say, um, that this is hell. Okay. We have the RZA kind of chiming in, adding in that this is not necessarily always unique to Americans, but we are probably the most guilty of it. And then finally, I guess I haven't mentioned Bishop yet, so let me shout him out. This is Kyle Bishop in his article called The Idle Proletariat, Dawn of the Dead, Consumer Ideology and the Loss of Productive Labor, written in 2010. He adds that there's also a labor element to this. He says, Romero zombies are not merely a metaphor. They're also the catalyst that reveals the true problem infecting humanity, pervasive consumerism. The surviving humans are inescapably consumers, and because the small Mall provide the mall provides them with all the supplies they could want they no longer have the need or perhaps more importantly the ability to produce the goods themselves thus in the new social paradigm of dawn surviving humans lose what marx calls their identity as species beings and are reduced to the level of life activity alone any labor they do expend is for sheer survival establishment barricades for safety pilfering the stores for food and clothing and seeking re- recreation to pass the time according to hegel labor is necessary to achieve consciousness and self-awareness By losing their productive labor, the feckless individuals living in Romero's Mall ultimately lose that which makes them essentially human, and they regress to a more primal or primitive animal state. That's actually kind of a fire argument, but an argument that I didn't at first think was going to come from this. And in fact, I I, I guess I was under the assumption that they were going to go a very, Bishop was going to go a very different route and saying that losing the labor shows like liberation, but he's actually not making that argument here at all, that losing labor makes them lose their identity. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, we have a whole episode on Marx's concept of alienation, so I'm not going to go into that here. You can check out that episode, but you know, I mean, he says it right here, according to Hegel, labor is necessary to achieve consciousness and self-awareness, right? So through the act of losing one's labor, right, essentially not having any tasks to focus on, nothing, th- th- there's nothing that makes you human, right? So you lose your humanity along with your labor. Fair enough. Okay. So those are the main metaphors that we have identified that we were probably going to dig a little bit more into. Like I said, we'll probably hit each and every one of these in their own standalone episode. I think I'm already writing off the one on the Cold War. It's not that interesting, but we figured we'd mention it anyway. But I think we are probably going to dig into uh, each of these a little bit more. So we've kind of set the table here. There are a couple of postscripts, though, that we want to get off our chest regarding um, the zombie metaphor and tropes and the distinctions between apocalypse and outbreak. So Nick, 
What are your thoughts? Is there even a real metaphor anymore? Yeah, that's my one comment is, and it comes, it's inspired by Mariani and I'll read his quote in a second. Like how much of this is, cause this is the complaint, right? That people have with film criticism and stuff. That's like, it's just entertainment, right? And we, we deconstruct all of these things to such an extent that like, it has no meaning anymore. Like, are we looking too much into this? Right? So his mm-hmm. quote is quote, Today, zombies are almost always linked with the end of the world via the zombie apocalypse, a global pandemic that turns most of the human population into beasts, ravenous for the flesh of their own kind. But there's no longer any clear metaphor. While America may still suffer major social ills, economic inequality, policy brutality, sorry, yeah, policy brutality, should that be police brutality? I don't know. Systemic racism, mass murder, zombies have been absorbed as entertainment that's completely independent from these dilemmas. So his argument is basically that, you know, we we consume zombie films as escape at this point, pure entertainment, that the fact that they might stand for something deeper is completely lost on all of us, right? And I, mm-hmm. I, I tend to agree with that for the most part, right? Nobody's watching you know, Dawn of the Dead and, you know, seeing like, wow, this is really about race and like, this is so powerful and oh my God, right? Like you're watching it because you're entertained. You're watching, you know, Army of the Dead because of the spectacle, right? It's all about the spectacle at this point. I don't know how many people are actually digesting all of those films and recognizing all of the deeper meaning and really, you know, taking that to heart. I doubt, I question that. But I think from our other concepts on notions of ethically constitutive stories, I think that's kind of the dangerous and scary part is that mm-hmm. we are just consuming these as entertainment and yet low key, they're still socializing us, whether we realize it or not, even if we're not consciously identifying the points or metaphors or tropes or meanings, or even if we're missing them completely and we're being socialized into something else like mm-hmm. cool shotgun, like I, f- I sounded like a caveman there, but shotgun cool. I like mm-hmm. shoot zombie, like something, you know what I'm saying? Like exactly. even that is their socialization there. I mean, if anything, it plays into like the prepper fantasy, right? Of Oh, absolutely. It really does play into that prepper fantasy and, mm-hmm. and, and those people are something special. Okay. The other postscript that we, we want to throw in here is about human nature. This was my postscript. I, originally, I had it as a metaphor, but I think Nick correctly removed it from the metaphor um, part and just it's, it's a postscript conversation that I, that I kind of wanted to have. Are we really assholes? So this one pertains mostly to the apocalyptic zombie. In other words, not during the outbreak, not when people are coming together and, 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 and just trying to survive at first, but once they've actually solved like the zombie problem and they start to recreate society, we always tend to recreate it the way, in fact, I mean, this is what I have to say. I'll just read what I, what I, what I put in our notes. He says, while this may or may not fit as a third wing under the othering paradigm, I think it deserves its own spot as there's this interesting dichotomy between early survivors coming together to make their new families and the next level community organization and eventual competition conflicts seen in the longer narratives like The Walking Dead as they intimate. So we talked about it in our last episode on Zombieland. The Zombies certainly maintain the rosy, optimistic view of the new family. Much, much more common, however, are the cautionary tales after the outbreak and as society starts to make itself anew. These are cautionary tales about greed, fear of strangers, violence, piracy, slave labor. All of these tropes make their way. Again, The Walking Dead's like the easiest example because it just carried on for so long, right? I, I don't, is it even still on? I don't know. Everyone's watched probably a season or two. I don't know how many they're on. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 10, but, plus there's a spinoff, I think. Okay. Regardless, there's also a gaming franchise. And I think it actually started as a comic book. So, or a graphic novel. I don't know. But regardless, there's so much content out there that there was obviously no way to go for them um, beyond just like, oh, this is cool. Like the initial coming together of, and I do remember the first couple episodes, like of the sheriff guy and his other sheriff friend and um, a couple of the other stragglers that were in like an RV. And eventually they come on with uh, uh, Michonne. I actually remember her name, the one with the two swords. Anyway, this first coming together of this survival family that you're rooting for eventually becomes something much different, right? Because the seasons just went on so long. Is there commentary that we're always just going to revert back to being the assholes we already are. And here's the other part of that trope that I think is important or conversation that I want to have. Survival is taken for granted. By the time we get to this, after only a few seasons, the zombies in The Walking Dead or even other ones aren't even a relevant part of the show anymore. Survival is taken for granted from an, it, aside from like an occasional character getting like lost in the woods and finally getting killed by zombies. But for the most part, if you're traveling in a group, you're in one of these settlements, the zombies are not really an issue for you anymore. They're, 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 a, they're an inconvenience now just a daily part of life. These longer narratives always recreate the same problems we face now. Hierarchy, exploitation, war, 
on a smaller scale. And perhaps the secondary rationale for this metaphor is the rationalization of our current plight as both creator and consumer lack the mental capacity to foresee any sort of paradigm shift. That's kind of the, the last thought I wanted to pose to you is like, when are creators and consumers both guilty of this, just merely recreate the world as it exists now in a smaller scale after the apocalypse? Is that because we just don't have I mean, and, and that's a mean thing for me to say, but I say it, a mental capacity to see anything beyond what we already know. Yeah, I mean, it also makes for good television, right? Like the rosy the, the rosy version where everyone gets along, like no one wants to watch that on TV, right? We need conflict and so on. Though now that I'm thinking about this more, I wonder if it actually represents reality in the sense that you know, like the first, the, the first little bit of The Walking Dead, the zombies are a very real issue, right? They're in your face. And right. so whatever metaphor we choose that the zombies represent, whether it's race or othering or, you know, they're the consumers and so forth, whatever that is, whichever we choose, that is in your face really for a little while. But then afterward, after a while, like you said, you know, they have their compounds and they've figured out all the tactics and so forth. And so the zombies are barely like an inconvenience. They just sort of exist on the peripheral Right. That's exactly how that is, right? Like there are times when, you know, this consume, critique of consumerism and so forth is really in our face. And there are times when we are merely just consuming and don't give any thought whatsoever to the ills of our consumption. And we just go on with our normal lives. So perhaps and it maybe is. that existing in that, 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 that television series as an example or in any film, that's real life. You know what I mean? Well, and it's not just in that form of media. Nick knows, Nick knows, and we may even add this into the one of the episodes. My favorite current form of media is actually a, a, a zombie game called DayZ, which is an open world game. I won't get into descriptions now, but long story short, it follows a very similar kind of path. Like at the very beginning, when you first like whatever, wake up or spawn in, the zombies are a big issue. But after, I don't know, an hour of gameplay and getting some gear and whatever, and maybe meeting a friend or two, at that point, they're just an annoyance, right? Like, oh man, I have to fight the zombie again before I go hunt down other players, right? Mm -hmm. They end up just being that same kind of inconvenience. And, and, and I do think there's something more there, but it doesn't seem limited just to this media form of the comic books, the graphic novels, the TV shows, and even some of the films. So anyway. I mean, whatever um, the social ills are that the zombies are supposed to represent in any of these right. media, in real life, the social ears, ills are merely an inconvenience that exists while we are going on with our lives consuming, right? Take us home, man. I like that. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please consider supporting us on Patreon. If you did, thank you, thank you, thank you to our Patreon supporters. I am Nick. I'm Jared. Later.